So welcome to Idea to IPO, Top 10 Legal Mistakes That Could Kill Your Startup. My name is Roger Royce. I'm a lawyer with the law firm of Haynes & Boone. It's an international law firm with offices throughout the world. I am resident in downtown Palo Alto, heart of the Silicon Valley. Uh, I do the Idea to IPO events frequently, and I'm here to talk to you tonight about the top 10 legal mistakes. Um, so as, as you know, I think most of you came to us through the Idea to IPO website or meetup. Uh, Idea to IPO is by far the largest uh, uh, startup meetup throughout the world with more than 100,000 members. It's been around for 10 years. It does numerous events on startup related topics. Uh, I have my little corner of, of that world myself, usually around legal issues, startup issue, business issues, et cetera. So tonight I'm going to talk for an hour about top 10 legal mistakes. We'll go from 7 p.m. Pacific to 8 p.m. Pacific, and then we're gonna open up for a, for a half hour of Q&A. Got my COVID shot today, so I'm hoping that uh, it doesn't all hit me you know, about halfway through, but if it does, uh, you won't notice, I'll just soldier on through. So a couple of things, we're going to record this. So if I talk fast and you miss something, don't worry, I'm gonna to send to all of you a copy of the recording. <laughs> Congrats, thank you. A copy of the recording, uh, as well as a copy of my slides. Um, I'll also send you a link to my YouTube channel where I've got hundreds of hours of content uh, like this or related to this, sometimes some variations. Uh, a lot of it is the same thing, just updated for what's going on in the world now. And I do want to tell you that I am putting together some all new content. It's going to be a little bit, actually, it's all new. It's going to be focused on legal developments, focused on really new developments in the startup world. COVID has changed everything. We're going to talk more about that. But for today, we're going to talk about my perennial favorite top 10 legal mistakes. Before we get going, I'd like to know who is in the audience. Um, how many Robs are startup entrepreneurs? Uh, how many are established or mature companies? Uh, how many investors, service providers? Oh, we got some students here tonight. How about that? Because sometimes I get students. Uh, we got investors, that's good. But, but as usual, it's about 80% startup entrepreneurs. That's usually about right. Um, all right, let's, let me leave it open for a few more seconds because we don't have everybody voted yet. 75% um, startups. Okay, and while I'm doing that, I see Stephen from Maryland is here. Who else is here? Can you turn on the captions? I have no idea how to do that. <laughs> I'm, I'm the IT guy as well as the speaker here tonight, but I'm not that good an IT guy. If someone wants to tell me how. Adam from Franken Tech is here. Monica from Inspirancy. Uh, Matt is here. Uh, uh, Deidre did not receive the link for the recording of the previous sessions. Deidre, go ahead and uh, email me and I'll send that to you. And uh, someone from Vietnam is here. Okay, 78% uh, startup entrepreneurs. All right, about usual and uh, just a handful of established companies, a uh, handful of, uh, of everything else, service providers, investors, academia. So it's going to be mostly startup entrepreneurs tonight. That's good to know, it's good to know because I'm gonna focus my comments on the startup community. Uh, I'm not quite done being nosy. Uh, I'd like to know where you're all from. Uh, we now, uh, or ID at IPO, I should say, can now do this worldwide with Zoom We've for the last year or so. And our audience is uh, international. It's usually about half North America, heavily Silicon Valley, but we get people from all over the world. Uh, for some topics, people will wake up in the middle of the night uh, from where they are and, and log in. What I'm going to talk about is highly US law centric. So I'm not sure it's going to be of a lot of interest uh, except for those of you who want to come here uh, to um, do business here in uh, Silicon Valley in California, United States, then this will be very relevant. Okay, so 22% um, Silicon Valley, 54% other North America. Wow, how about that? Asia, 5%. Western Europe, 5%. Eastern Europe, 3%. Africa, 8%. Um, how about that? Uh, South, we've got South Pacific, we've got Eastern Europe and Russia, um, and we've even got other. That's, wow, all over the world. So we're a very international group tonight. 
Okay, so like I say, we're gonna go through this for about an hour. And uh, I see I'm already getting questions. If you have questions, put them in the Q&A box. If you have chat, things that I probably need to know about now, my sound is off, uh, you can't hear me, you can't see me, something like that, chat that to me. But if it's a question, put it in the Q&A box and I'll get to it um, uh, towards the end of the evening. Uh, before we start, uh, take a look at the chat. That's me. That's how you can get a hold of me. That's my email. That's my LinkedIn. That's our LinkedIn group, which I really want you to join. It's our Startup Solutions LinkedIn group. I just created it. I think it's awesome. Uh, I hope you do too. So uh, please join. All righty. Any other announcements? If you're tweeting tonight, hashtag idea to IPO. Um, we are not streaming tonight. And uh, I think we're ready to get the show on the road. So now comes the most difficult part of the evening, although I'm getting pretty darn good at it, which is the share screen. So first of all, somebody chat me and tell me you can see my screen. One time I talked for about 15 minutes with nobody seeing my screen. Thank you, Rob Lau. Okay, there we go. All right, top legal mistakes I could cure you a startup. Now, let me tell you a little bit about me. If you don't know me, you won't hear me. Uh, I've been doing this a long time. I'm extremely old. Uh, I started in the oil patch out in, out in Western North Dakota, believe it or not. I did work in the agricultural uh, industry when I started. I represented farmers and ranchers. Uh, I moved from there, uh, again, believe it or not, to New York City. I worked on Wall Street. I worked with investment bankers. You saw Wolf, Wolf of Wall Street. Yeah, that was, that was my guys. Um, <laughs> And uh, I came out to uh, Hollywood for a little while when I first came to California, who doesn't? Uh, did some work in the entertainment industry. Um, that was, uh, yeah, well, that was not fun, being real honest with you. And eventually ended up here in Silicon Valley where I do tech. So I've been all over. I've done a lot of work. I've worked with a lot of kinds of companies. And I do quite a, probably half of what I do is international for the last 20 years. So I've kind of seen a lot of different things, but what I notice is that we see a lot of the same legal mistakes, different markets, different geographies, different people, different industries, people seem to make the same mistakes. Uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit about that, but I'm really gonna focus on the mistakes that startups uh, are not going to make, you're not going to make anyway, because you're watching this presentation and you're gonna know enough to be ready for it uh, when it gets there. Somebody asked how all this translates into the law of your home jurisdiction. I think you said Canada. Um, most of this pretty well, but I am gonna spend some time going through the California specific provisions because I'm in California, uh, a lot of startups are here and uh, it's really important. Does everybody have audio? Somebody lost audio in our chat. Uh, chat me if you got audio so I can keep going. Yes, okay, good. If you chat at me, no, then I know you were putting me on. All right, my number 10 mistake is using an employer's facilities. Here is the scenario. You and your fraternity brothers or whoever it is have come up with a great idea, your buddies, your work buddies, whoever it is. Um, and um, you sit down and you map it out and then you come see me. The very first question I ask founders when they walk into my office with their idea uh, that they're gonna use for their startup company is do you have a day job, okay? Do you have a day job? Uh, the answer is usually yes. Uh, if it does, then we gotta go through three or four things, right? And then here are the top three. Stephen Jobs said, keep it to three. So I'm gonna nar narrow this down to three. This idea of yours, this startup company of yours, did you do that on your time or did you do that on your employer's time? Okay, did you do that on your time or your employer's time? If you did it on your employer's time instead of the employee's time, meaning during work hours instead of nights and weekends, your employer may have some ownership in whatever it is that you've developed. So you might not be able to claim that you own it. Um, I'm gonna tell you why that's important in a minute. And let's go through the three. Number two, did you use the employer facilities? And by facilities, it's just what you think, where you sit in their office while you were working on your idea. That's a really bad thing. Don't do that. Do that at home. Even if you're at home, don't use your employer's computer when you build that thing. And by the way, they're going to know because when you leave, they're going to get your computer and they're going to do their, their, their voodoo on it and figure out everything you've ever done on it. 
okay? You techies can tell me more about how that happens than I can. I've just seen it happen enough because I've been on both sides of that issue that you have to assume transparency. So don't do it on your computer and uh, for God's sakes, don't do it and then try to cover it up. And then thirdly, and this is the big one uh, that's a little bit, a little bit sneaky, not sneaky, but maybe counterintuitive. Is this related to your employer's business? Is this the thing that your employer hired you to do? If they hired you to create a widget, you can't really go create a widget you know, for yourself and go market it. That's what the employer paid you for. Technically, you might say it should not be related to the employer's business and should not result from work performed for the employer. So we have to clear those hurdles. Now, if we do, then you're golden. We're off and running. We can go take that idea and start a company on nights and weekends. Here in California, you can do that even if you have an agreement that says that you can't, okay? Let me say that again. If you're in California, the law, the, your employer cannot prohibit you from doing this outside stuff. That's just labor law in California. It's one of the things that helped build the Silicon Valley and encourage innovation. Not so in every state, certainly not so in every country. So check your employer policies, your employer agreement, your employment agreement, if you have one more than anything, anything that you might assign. Now, what's the significance if we mess this up? Uh, and this is the first time, holy cow, we're eight minutes into this already, uh, five minutes, and I haven't even mentioned yet my book, Dead on Arrival, How to Avoid the Legal Mistakes That Could Kill Your Startup. Uh, I wish I had a copy here, but that's okay because I'm gonna email a copy to everybody that attends here tonight. Um, in that book, I talk about dead on arrival legal mistakes. This is a dead on arrival legal mistake. Uh, if you're trying to go exploit something that technically belongs to your employer, you're not going to get very far. Um, because if you get any success at all, and they're going to know, um, you're going to get a cease and desist letter, uh, or at least a uh, shot across the bow saying, uh, look, um, this is ours. We claim ownership in this. Or maybe more judiciously, we want to remind you that you have obligations to us because you signed an invention assignment when you weren't to work for us, uh, that anything you created for us belongs to us. That's the letter you're gonna get from the employer. Now, why is that such a big deal? Why is that a dead on arrival sort of issue? And this is a little bit technical, but it's, you know, you, you need to know this. This is so fundamental uh, to your business if you're a tech startup. When you're gonna have, you need to own your technology. You need to own your intellectual property. When you go talk to an investor, one of the things they're gonna ask you almost immediately, they're gonna make you promise that you own your intellectual property. That intellectual property is that idea. It's not just patents, not just trademarks. It's that idea, that legally protectable idea that arises to a property right. Uh, ownership in the law doesn't mean that you have the right to use it. It means you have the right to keep other people from using it. This desk here, um, I own it only because I have the legal right to keep someone bigger than me from taking it away from me, okay? That's ownership in the law. If you can't keep somebody from taking, you know, this thing, this trade secret, this thing you think is a trade secret and going out and exploiting it themselves, you can't claim ownership. Super important. It's a dead on arrival issue uh, oftentimes. Now, um, I'm just saying it's an important issue most of the time. Now, let's suppose we did mess this up, right? I mean, we can probably fix it, okay? If we catch it early enough, we can go back to the employer, we can make a deal, we can do a cross license. There might be things we can do before this becomes, you know, the, the next uh, Facebook or whatever. What's a next something better? It seems, seems kind of old fashioned to say the next Facebook. Uh, I need a better, I need a better company to use an example. But uh, pay attention to this, because if you wait until you do your big splashy press, out, press release about this, it's going to be too late. It's too valuable. Nobody's going to cut you any slack. Using an employer's facilities. All right, this is one that cuts across um, country lines and borders. This is one that cuts across industries. This is the one thing that I've seen everywhere I've been, everywhere I've practiced, uh, everybody, every kind of industry I've worked in. It's every startup company, every new business, every new company, even big, well-established companies. This is a mistake that they make, lack of documentation. You really ought to get in the habit of documenting everything, everything. And you'd be surprised how little it takes. Uh, if you deal with me, I'll drive you nuts with emails, confirming this, confirming that. This is what we talked about. This is what we agreed. This is what you were going to do. This is what I was going to do. Uh, documentation is just so important. 
um, because I promise you a year from now, no one's going to remember what happened to three years from now when you're successful, no one's going to remember and people are going to remember things differently. Let me put it that way. That's contracts, employment agreements and transactions. Now, here's a practice pointer. By the way, that's my new, that's my new signature line. That's my new calling card, calling card, practice pointers. Here's a practice pointer for you. I'm going to give you a tip. I'm going to tell you something that you probably haven't heard any place before. Um, and this is where the technology and the law are converging and are catching up. Here's a really super good habit to get into. Create a data room. Make it really organized. Have little folders in that data room, that virtual data room in the cloud. And the folders are, here's a place for um, contracts. Here's a place for corporate records. Here's a place for, you know, whatever else, IP. Um, Here's a place uh, for employment contracts and employment records. Be careful about putting that in the cloud, of course. But have a data room. Start that early and start populating that early. It'll save you so much hassle on the back end. When it comes to do that financing and people get into due diligence, and it'll be so easy to rope your lawyer into it and show them everything you've done. You can do that in real time. I'm, um, by way of example, I'm, I'm working on a transaction now for a company that I formed uh, more than 20 years ago. Uh, I know this because I'm looking at records that are more than 20 years old. And um, this is back before we saved things to PDF. It's before I even had a scanner because uh, I remember when I got my first scanner. Um, so here's a big surprise, big surprise. I can't find some signature pages, right? You know, big surprise. Uh, that used to be the way it, it always was years ago. But there's no excuse for that now because we can say things electronically and we can put it in the cloud, we can put it in a data room. Um, fortunately, you know, I will find all those. I just have to dig through a bunch of old paper files. But um, we're not going to have those problems anymore because we're going to get a data room and save everything electronically. Common issues on this one. Um, this is where lack of documentation becomes a dead on arrival issue. Equity ownership. Okay, I do a whole presentation on how to split the pie, how to divide the pie and split up, um, split up equity in a company. And don't assume that it's one third, one third, one third. Don't assume anything about equity ownership. Um, you really got to get that in writing. And you'd be very surprised how little writing will suffice. Okay, I have seen people make millions of dollars off the back of a co cocktail napkin. I'm not making that up. That sounds so cliche, you know, that's back how we did it in the 90s. You know, people would walk into my office with a cocktail napkin saying, look what was written on this napkin. And I say, yeah, you're right. You, you have a claim to 5% of this company. So um, I don't recommend doing your legal agreements on cocktail napkins. Um, I think that you should have proper contracts with real attorneys. Uh, but uh, I just say that because you know, there's really no excuse not to have anything in writing. Uh, and when it comes to writing, equity ownership is one of those things that people tend to put off a little too long. It's an uncomfortable conversation. I totally get that. I feel you, brother. You know, you don't want to have to, you know, measure your worth against your co-founders uh, by dividing up equity, but you have to do that. Log into one of our presentations on how to split the pie and reward contributors, and we'll give you some really good ways of doing it. The important thing for today, though, is make sure you get it in writing. Secondly, this one's a little more subtle. You might not think of that. The equity ownership, everybody gets that immediately. This one, it comes up because you're not thinking about it. In fact, what you're really doing, you're thinking about two different things. Typical scenario, I like to, I'm gonna, I like to think about it really simply. Money partner, service partner, right? You got the money here and you got the sweat equity here. That's oftentimes how, how it happens. Now, of course, the money partner is gonna have some connections and, and know-how and services, of course. And, and the service partner, the techie person, you know, he's going to contribute more than just technology and service. So, but that's generally somebody's putting in more money than the other. The person who's putting in more money than the other, they might think it's going in as a loan. The other partner might think that, well, that's just their contribution. Why is that important? Because a loan has to be repaid in preference to everything else, including any of the equity. You got to have a writing to document that. 
And you can't make an assumption that it's going to fall in one category or the other if you don't have a writing. Because the answer is, having been through these disputes, is who knows? You know, what will a jury believe? Um, and what will they make out of those emails? Get that one in writing. And you're not only writing to the jury, you're writing to the IRS. And if you do become successful and the IRS does uh, ever, um, the IRS has been lamed lately, but if it ever comes back, it's taken forever to get EINs, by the way. But if they, uh, when they do come back and they will, um, this loan debt versus equity analysis has is, is always been a favorite for them to go after. And they can go after this. Why is it a difference? Because if you get a recovery of a loan, well, that's just a repayment of your loan. That's not taxable income. If you get a, if you get a distribution on your equity from a profitable company with earnings and profits, ooh, that could be taxable as a dividend. That's really bad. So it's important to document both for the IRS, but also for your partners. I've even seen people come along and say, well, I put money in, of course, I should get preferred stock, you know, and, and you're all done once people take positions like that. And then finally is vesting. Um, I could talk a, for a lot about vesting. Um, I'm in favor of it, as you might guess. What is vesting for those of you who are just tuning in? Um, vesting is the idea that you earn into your shares, you earn into your ownership uh, in the company through continued service. And the way vesting usually works is through a, a lapsing repurchase right. In other words, um, I'm going to get um, a million shares of XYZ startup. I'm going to invest over four years. That's two, I don't do math very well, but I can do 250,000 a year. That means that if I leave after one year, I'm 25% vested. I have to sell at cost, which is close to nothing, my 750,000 shares back to the company, I get to keep my 250,000 shares and sit there and, you know, if I, if I if we're still doing certificates, I'll put them on my wall and, um, you know, take them to the nightclub with me and impress people. Um, and then someday maybe it'll be worth some money. That's the idea behind vesting. You got to have that in writing. You can't assume people are all thinking you're going to vest. First of all, you all should vest if you're founders, if you're service providers, you absolutely positively should vest every single one, including advisors, including uh, employees, sometimes even consultants. Um, but you don't unless you have it in writing, unless you have a contract. That's a really important one. Google and read the story of Zipcar. Um, there's a company that got vesting wrong. They recovered. You know, they managed to make something out of it. They were you know, wildly successful, but um, the founders publicly talked about the fact that they got vesting wrong. You know, they should have done this better at the front end. So don't make that mistake because not everybody has something that is so good and so powerful as Zipcar um, that, that you can survive a mistake like that. Oftentimes you can't. Oftentimes it, that just takes too much equity. You know, why, let me pause on this for a second. Why is that so important? Let's suppose you have a founder, we forgot to do vesting, founders got a third because you got three founders and you split it equally and they leave with their one third of the stock that's fully vested. Okay, what's the big deal, right? Okay, so maybe he gets a little bit of a windfall. What's the big deal? Why am I talking so much about it? Well, now you've taken a third of the common, of, of the currency of your company, you've just completely taken it out. You've taken it out of your internal money supply. We'll say it that way. You no longer have that common stock to incentivize founders. Now the investors come along and I see a much smaller pool, right? And what they're thinking is, is there gonna be enough stock in this deal to keep these founders incentivized? Or are we gonna get to an exit and I'm gonna have to give back some of my hard fought preferences, me, the investor, you know, negotiated for through some sort of carve out plan. You know, they're thinking that. So if you get vesting wrong, that could be, um, that could be a gating item for getting future investment and that could be in at the company. So that's why I'm talking about it so much. Make sure you get that in writing, make sure you get it right. And this is not something you should do without a lawyer, by the way. Um, why is that? Because um, there are technicalities around this. There are legal restrictions. Uh, there's a tax filing that has to be made. Uh, that's up to you, the service provider employee founder. Okay, that's up to you to make that tax filing. It's up to you to make it within 30 days of when you get your stock. Um, that's when you have to make that election. If you don't, you get a very bad tax consequence down the road. Now, I've got complex, expensive, risky ways of dealing with that. If you've made that mistake, if you forgot to make that 83B election, 
Um, you don't really want to go there if you don't have to. You'd rather just, you know, the IRS has given you a roadmap and said, let's do this nice and easy. Uh, every once in a while, people forget to make those elections. Uh, so that's a mistake, but it's one I can usually fix. Now, let's talk a little more about vesting because this is so important. All founders should vest, okay? How much should they vest? Um, usually I see three years, okay? Sometimes you see four, five is way on the outside. It's three to five, usually three, uh, with credit for time served, basically. So if somebody's worked for a while and then vest it, we'll give them credit for that time. Don't get too hung up on that number, three, four, or five, because most companies, you're going to be vesting for a lot longer than that, a lot longer than three, four, or five. Why is that? Because when the investors come and put money in your company a year from now, they're going to reset that clock because they need to make sure you stick around long enough uh, to make them a return on their money. That's the Series A. And then the Series B, the next investors come along a year and a half after that, and they say the same thing. Oh, we need to reset your vesting clock. You got to stay here another three years and, and earn back into it. You're going to see that throughout the life of the company. You might expect to vest for eight years, even though we might say three at the front end. Don't freak out about that. Don't push back on that. It's just the way things are done. That's Hollywood. I guess that's Silicon Valley, I should say. But you might start with three, but you know this, these big fights people have over three or four years, I'm not sure it's worth it because it's going to vest longer than that by the time you're done. Acceleration, single double trigger. What do I mean by that? So let's say that you've... Um, um, let's say that your shares are now subject to vesting. And you, um, you might be thinking, gee, you know, um, what happens if we sell this company in two years and I got three year vesting and it's a stock for stock deal? I think I should be able to just exit, to just take 100% of my proceeds from that sale. Uh, and I should just be able to sell all that if I want to or stick around or exit or whatever I want to do. Well, um, how are we going to accomplish that? You might ask for what they call a single trigger acceleration, meaning that if you sell the, if the company gets sold, all of my shares automatically vest. So when Microsoft comes along and gives us Microsoft stock for my startup company stock, I'm fully vested in those Microsoft shares. That's a single trigger. You never get that. You never get that. Oftentimes requested, rarely granted. Okay. Another single trigger is um, what happens if I get fired for no good reason, terminate it without cause, or I leave for a good reason, something like that. I should get full vesting. It's not my fault. Um, that's another single trigger if we accelerate all your vesting on that. Often requested, rarely granted. For founders, very senior people, what is sometimes requested is double trigger, meaning that if those, both those things happen within a short period of time, six months or a year, then I get full or partial additional vesting. So if my job is made redundant because I'm a CFO and the acquiring company doesn't need another CFO, well, and they let me go without cause, well, I should get additional vesting in that case. I stuck around, I got the company sold and it wasn't my fault I got fired. If you're wise, you'll ask for that if you're a very senior person. You won't give that in your stock option plan. You won't give that to everybody. It's just too expensive. Acceleration is expensive. Why is it expensive? Because on an acquisition, if shares accelerate, that means the buyer has to come up with new shares uh, to, to put vesting restrictions on, to keep people motivated to stick around and build the company. Where are those new shares going to come from? They're going to come out of the hides of the founders. So uh, don't you don't want to provide that to everybody, but there are a few executives and founder level people that you will. Finally, advisor vesting. Advisor vesting, your, every good company should have advisors, okay? That's, generalizations are risky, but I like that one. Being an advisor myself to a lot of companies. Uh, what an advisor does is there's somebody that has a lot of very specific uh, expertise that's relevant to your company. Might be technical, might be sales, might, they might be able to help you find financing. I've seen a lot of advisors do that, whatever it is. Your currency as a startup is equity, so you reward them in equity but you need them to stick around and do the thing you hired them to do. How do we do that? Usually there's a time-based element. It's usually two years. Um, and there should also be a milestone or a performance metric. In other words, they should have to achieve some goal in order to get their vesting. Because the trouble with advisors 
you don't see them that often. They're not showing up at work every day. I guess nobody is right now, but they're not on your Zoom call with you every day. You know, you call on them when you need them. You expect them to perform pretty specific discrete, discrete tasks. So that's why your vesting will be tied to the performance of those tasks. Okay, we talked about tax. I'll just tell you one little trap here, and this is a little arcane, but for those of you who wanna know, um, what happens if um, this 83B election, I told you what a disaster it is when we forget to make it, unless you come to me and I fix it for you for a lot of money. But what happens if um, you, you, know, you, you, you don't have vesting on your shares, you get, they're fully vested when they get issued to you, a year from now, you go talk to an investor and an investor says, oh, no, 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 we need to unvest your shares. So you unvest them. Do you have to file that 83B election then? Okay. There was a time when we just filed these things all over the place, protective elections, just to be careful about it. Uh, the IRS says, well, no. And the reason why is because we don't have a transfer of property in that case. So we'll let you off the hook if you don't file the 83B election in that scenario. Okay. What happens if uh, instead the vesting gets imposed on an acquisition? So the acquirer comes along and says, you know what? We're gonna do a stock swap. You take my acquiring stock in exchange for your startup company stock. But the difference is my acquiring company stock is gonna have these vesting restrictions. So you have to stick around and make this thing work. What do you think? That's vesting after the fact too. The IRS being the IRS uh, said, well, in that case, you do have to file an 83B election or you're out of luck because that is a transfer of property. That's a new transaction. Well, here's what happens sometimes. Uh, you'll have a um, California corporation or better yet, um, maybe you have a foreign corporation or maybe you have a, um, uh, the best case is a limited liability or something and you convert that through a little merger transaction. So for a California company to migrate to Delaware, and by the way, everybody is a Delaware C corporation. You all, all have heard that, I'm sure. So you started out as a California corporation, who knows why, uh, you've seen the error of your ways, the investors have convinced you, let's convert you to a Delaware corporation. You have to do that through a merger under our corporate statutes. Well, I don't know, do we need a new 83B election? I can argue that one both ways. So you know, be careful about that. This stuff is, is uh, very sophisticated and arcane and, um, and comes up in a lot of different ways. So at this point, I wanna remind people, if you have questions, I'm gonna take Q&A at the top of the hour, enter them in the Q&A box, not in the chat box, use the chat box to tell me that you have to leave now and things like that, uh, that you can't hear me, you can't hear me, et cetera. All right, where are we? We're at 7.35. We're about halfway through the time. We've been at it for half an hour and I'm on slide five of 16, so I'm gonna have to speed it up. But first, uh, and, I, and I'm doing good, by the way, I'm hanging in there, not even feeling that COVID shot, by the way, you know, 50 is the new 29. Uh, I was standing in line today and everybody was claiming to be 50, you know, over 50. Go figure. Uh, for those of you in California, you know why. Uh, if you're over 50, you can get the shot. So uh, inadequate tax prep. I mean, I'm over 50 now. Uh, later on tonight, I'm going to be 29 again. So <clears throat> inadequate tax preparation. This is another uh, problem. This is another problem, a mistake that startup companies use. And it's gotten a lot easier to recover from this one uh, over the last three, since 2017, however many, many years that is, because 2018, that's when we had a new tax law that reduced the rate of corporate income tax. We used to agonize over this before then. We used to agonize, used to, you know, gripe about how much tax it was costing to be a Delaware C corporation, then we'd be a Delaware C corporation. Now we don't agonize as much, then we'd be a Delaware C corporation. The moral of the story is 99% of the time, if you're a startup company, you're going to be a Delaware C corporation. Delaware, because that is the jurisdiction of choice, it's the gold standard, everybody around the world knows Delaware, that is the gold standard for investors, that's what they want, you can abrogate class voting, you have a lot, a big body of law, um, if the Secretary of State's office is relatively easy to deal with, so um, Delaware, 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 that's what you see, C Corp, that's all the VCs will invest in, that's it. Now you, you get outside of the Silicon Valley and you'll find investment funds and investors that'll do complex LLC structures. It's a lawyer's playground. I love it when I find those. I just don't find those very often. Uh, they're very labor intensive, okay? You're as a startup company, 
almost always going to be a Delaware C corporation. Why is that? Why should you care? And what can you do about that? Here's another little practice pointer for you, because that's my signature, right? That's my, sig my thing, you know, practice pointer. I just made that up. Practice pointer is you can go tell your investors, hey, you know what? You invest in my company, a Delaware C corporation, I can issue to you qualified small business stock, QSBS. You know what that means? That means you hold on to that stock for, I'm worth less than $50 million, we're a startup. You buy that stock for cash, you hold on to it for, and it's not a safe, not a promissory note, but stock. You hold on to it for five years and then you exit. You can exclude up to $10 million or 10 times your cost uh, from federal income tax here in the United States. Holy cow. And you know what? I was looking at the Biden tax plan this week. Doesn't mention it. Doesn't mention it. You know, it is sacrosanct. It is not going anywhere. You know, for the last 20 years, uh, actually more than that, since the late 90s, I think, I think it's 97 when we, when we got something like that. Anyway, forever. <laughs> um, I've been telling people, I wouldn't count on that qualified small business stock if I were you, because you don't know when Congress is going to just get rid of that. Well, I guess I'm kind of convinced Congress is not going to get rid of it. It's a huge benefit. You ought to be touting it. Uh, and you ought to have a C corporation so you can tell your investors what a great deal it is. Now, if you got about an hour and a bottle of wine and good calculator, I'll go through the math and tell you why it's not, a, it's, it's not any better than a pastor like an LLC or an S corp. Nobody wants to hear that. No one wants to hear that. It's much easier just to say you don't pay any tax at the shareholder level for federal purposes. You do for state if you're unfortunate enough to be a resident of California, but otherwise not. I'm not going to go through all this other tax stuff. Um, it's uh, it's too late in the day, and um, uh, we've got other things to talk about. Uh, I will just say there are lots of there are lots of issues here, but I've kind of hit on the big one, and the important thing to remember is that most startups are going to have to be a Delaware C Corp, but give it a little thought because sometimes you're not. Okay, I will hit on one of these. Sometimes you wanna be an LLC. When do you wanna be an LLC? An LLC can elect to be taxed as a partnership. Why is that a big deal? Why do you wanna be taxed as a partnership? Because that's a pastor, that's one level of tax. Uh, the VCs won't invest in it, but that's a very tax efficient structure under current law, might not be, you know, later, but under current law, that's a very efficient structure because there's a big, there's a big uh, credit, a qualified QBI credit, they call it, qualified business income credit. You can reduce the tax on that income. So you would do that if you could. And if you were going to be what I call a lifestyle business, you're going to operate your business. You're going to have revenue. You're going to have income. That's a dirty word in Silicon Valley. We don't want to see taxable income. We want to reinvest and do growth hacking and all that stuff. But if you're going to be the kind of company that's going to have income, an LLC might be the right answer. An S Corp might be the right answer. We can avoid payroll taxes with an S Corp. There's benefits if you're going to be anything other than a really high flying, fast growing, um, explosive startup company. Now, the reason I use LLCs is sometimes a company doesn't know. We could go either way, right? We can make some money, be a good, profitable little business here, you know, provide for me and my family and, and pass it on to my kids at the end of the road. Or I might get lucky and I might have the next Snapchat or whatever the next big company is. Okay. So if you don't know, then you do an LLC. And if you do be, get lucky and you hit it big, you convert to a corporation down the road. Uh, that's the strategy. I do that a lot. There's pros and cons. I'll just warn you right now, but it is something that is regularly done. So when I say inadequate tax preparation, what I really mean is think about that. Don't automatically assume, even though I told you 99% of startups are C-Corps, that you're a C-Corp too. Let's first find out if you're the kind of company that it should be a C-Corp because you're going to be a, you know, a fast growing startup that is either going to go, go big or go home. Now we're on tax and I am a tax lawyer, by the way. So uh, unfortunately, I apologize in advance for this. We're gonna talk a little more tax. There is, as you know, there's a huge infrastructure bill in front of Congress. As you probably know, um, the government spent tons of money last year. Uh, some form of infrastructure bill is going to pass. It's gonna be very expensive. Someone's gonna to have to pay for it. And it's going to be the taxpayer. That's pretty clear. The Biden tax plan wants to raise our corporate tax rate from 21 to 28%. Okay, and that's the tax that that Delaware C Corp is going to pay in its income. 
Most startups I know don't care about that because they don't have taxable income anyway. But keep in mind, it goes into the choice of entity decision. If you're one of those rare ones that is going to be uh, successful immediately. The Biden tax plan does a few other things, okay? Um, it um, makes it harder to avoid tax on income that's moved offshore. I could spend an hour going through how that works, but just trust me, it's going to um, increase the overall rate of tax that corporate America pays just because of the way things are structured. Um, it's also been proposed to get rid of this QBI benefit. So it makes it you know, less attractive to be a C Corp because raising the tax rate less attractive to be a pastor because it's taken away deductions that they have. So I guess the moral of the story is that we're in flux here on tax and um, you just can't plan around it. In 2018, after the corporate rate went down um, from 35% corporate to 21, a lot of my clients, they went in and they converted their S corps that are pass-throughs and paying tax at individual rates. They converted them into C corps. Everybody's so proud of themselves. Uh, they usually did it without talking to me because I was the one who had to say, aren't you a little worried that someday you might get a president who wants to put that tax back up? Well, that's exactly what's happened. Um, so if you're stuck in it, you're stuck in it. Not much we can do. If you're not stuck in it yet, give that a little thought. So the world is in flux. It is going to get worse tax wise. I, you know, it just is. It just has to. How bad it is and whose ox get gored. That's what we don't know yet. Uh, but that's nothing compared to how bad it's going to get on the labor law front for a startup company, especially if you're a gig economy type company. And this brings me to my next uh, legal mistake is messing up on employment and labor laws. So startup law is kind of an interesting thing because a person has to be a little bit of a jack of all trades. And most startup lawyers I know, they've got their one thing they do really well, like really good on intellectual property, you know, and they know enough about the rest. Really good on securities law, and they know enough about the rest, right? One, one type of lawyer that you need to know about, and you're going to have to consult at some point, is a labor lawyer or employment lawyer, if you're in California especially, um, because the law is, is very unstartup friendly, and it's getting worse. Now, let me give you where the problem is. This is the mistake that you do not want to make. Um, and I'll do that by telling you a story. Once upon a time, there was a company that decided to set up a platform and that platform would allow uh, housekeepers to go register on a platform. People looking for housekeepers like me, we'd go on a platform, we'd find somebody, we'd use the platform to arrange for them to come over to my house when I'm not here and make it sparkle. So when I got home, uh, it was all cleaned up and I didn't have to think about it. I paid the platform, the platform paid the housekeeper. Nobody withheld on taxes on anything. Nobody treated anybody as an employee. Uh, this company raised $40 million in venture capital. Then they got sued in a class action lawsuit and then they ended. And the CEO said, the class action lawsuit brought us down. The employee misclassification issue brought us down. It's that big an issue. It's that big a deal. It's a company killer if you get this one wrong. Reed Hoffman has a podcast you should all listen to called Masters of Scale. He talks about the fires that you startup entrepreneurs have to let burn, the things you have to let go, the things you have to close one eye and look the other way because you know you just can't fix all the bugs when you're trying to innovate, right? This is not a fire you can let go. This is the forest fire. This is the Napa fire. This is one you got to drop everything and make sure you get this right because labor law violations can bring you down, especially misclassification. What is misclassification? That's when, um, that's when you treat a person who should be an employee as a contractor, an independent contractor. You don't withhold, you don't, um, um, you don't give them benefits, you don't do workers comp, by the way, which is a criminal violation. That means you can go to jail for it. That's right, you don't do workers comp, you don't do unemployment, you don't do all that stuff. That's that's misclassification. That is the Napa fire. Um, yeah, Masters of Scale is the podcast. That's right. Can't remember which episode. It's an awesome podcast. Everyone should listen to it. Okay, so misclassification, you got to get that right. And the problem is, is it's way harder to get that right in California now because everyone's heard about AB5, the, um, the ride share. <laughs> it was the, uh, the law that was designed to uh, treat... Uber drivers, basically rideshare drivers as employees, 
but it was much more expansive. Um, but then AB 2257 came along and we have now almost a hundred exceptions to law. I'm not making this up. There are almost a hundred exceptions to this law in California. Is it really a good law if you need a hundred exceptions to it? You tell me. So you might be covered if you're a psychologist, but not a psychiatrist. I get them confused. I forget which one has the better lobby. So I don't remember who, who's carved out of the law or not, but it's kind of like that. Attorneys are carved out. You'll be happy to know. I, I knew that would make you happy. Makes me happy. Um, but a lot of people are not. A lot of people are not, and uh, they're put at a huge competitive disadvantage in California. Um, the rideshare companies, ironically, are carved out because of a proposition that went to the voters uh, who said, no, we don't want Uber and Lyft to leave the state. We'd rather that the, the, you know, the rideshare drivers be treated as contractors. So that's the state of the play in California right now. It's, it's a little counterintuitive and confused. And I know someone's going to ask me about software engineers. Maybe I'll talk about that at the end if I get time, because uh, that question comes up a lot. There's a big long Reddit on it. Um, I have a view. Um, and salespeople, I also have a view on that. But, but generally, you need to err on the side of making someone an employee. Why am I talking so much about this when half of more than half of everybody is not even from California? Well, I will tell you why. It's because there is a bill introduced in the Senate to make AB5, our California rule, the law of the land throughout the entire nation. Well, how likely is that to pass? Joe Biden loves it. He supported it. It's in his platform. He's going to push for it. He thinks that AB5 it should be the law of the land throughout the country. I'm not saying he's right or wrong. I'm not saying he's good or bad. I'm not taking a position. I'm just telling you that you have a president who wants to really tighten the noose on misclassification because the administration believes that too many workers are, are not being classified properly or being cheated out of their benefits and their tax withholding and et cetera, et cetera. And overtime pay and meal breaks and all this and discrimination, legal protections, all the things that employees get. Um, and we have a 50-50 Senate. So this could happen, this could happen. So pay attention to that if you're a platform company. Uh, there is some practices and lore and business methods that are developing that work with these. I advise a few companies that do this. So we just need to be careful. Finally, to finish this off, I hate talking about this topic because it's just nothing but scary stories. Uh, there's this thing called uh, private attorney general's action in California. Um, there's also, we have a thing here called class action lawsuits. Uh, suffice it to say that if you do get this wrong, uh, an employee can cause you so many problems. They can sue your company on behalf of not only themselves, but everybody who is similarly situated. And they get their attorney's fees if they recover $1 from you. So it's so that's the biggest one. That's the biggest dead on arrival issue. Let's get to a couple more because we're running out of time. Failing to protect intellectual property. This again is where paper is so important. There's a document called a proprietary information agreement and invention assignment. It's also called a confidential information agreement and invention assignment. That is the document that you, Mr. Founder, Mr. Startup Founder, are going to have all your consultants, employees, anybody who touches your IP, defined broadly, including trade secret, is going to sign that says, even though I built this, I built it for you, Mr. Company. Startup Company belongs to you, Mr. Startup Company, and I'm not going to claim any rights of ownership in it. I could talk a lot about that, uh, about uh, failing to protect IP, but that's number one. Um, number two, I want to mention is, um, and let's just move on. I might come back if I have time, but I want to get to the really important thing, which is trade secret. Most of my clients, trade secret is one of the biggest IP assets they have. What is IP? Intellectual property. Of course, it's registrations, patents, trademarks, sometimes copyrights. We all know about that. Um, and then um, some of the, the other, the sub-modalities, we'll call it trade dress, et cetera. But trade secret's a big one. And trade secret doesn't depend on registration. Trade secret depends on three things, generally. And this is true in California. It's true in the United States because we have a federal trade secret law. And I have found this to be generally true in other parts of the world, although you want to make sure that you fit the definition of every country that you have people in. Number one, um, it has to be secret, okay? It's a trade secret, so it's pretty obvious. It has to be valuable, it has to have independent economic value from being secret. 
that seems pretty obvious too. You wouldn't care about letting it go if it weren't valuable. And here's the tough one. It has to be subject to your reasonable efforts to maintain its secrecy. So if you're not trying to keep it secret, a court's not going to do it for you. So what does that mean? That means NDAs with anybody that sees your trade secret. That means that you um, have a really good um, system in place, a trade secret system in place, uh, systems and processes for trade secret protection, a trade secret policy. And that policy will tie fairly closely into your security policies. Not everybody has access to all aspects of your trade secret. Maybe different people have different parts, what they need to know. Um, not everybody can access it. Not everybody has the passwords. Not everybody has the keys to get into your building, to steal the dot, whatever. You know, you, you have to have a policy and you have to have reasonable procedures in place and you'd be well advised to put those down in writing. Here we come back to paper again. And since we're talking about trade secret and paper, here is another practice pointer. That's my signature thing, by the way. I don't know if you knew that. Practice pointer, you should get all of your people to write stuff down. Just keep a notebook, your engineers, your scientists, your technical people, just write down you know, what they're doing, what they worked on, what they did, put it in that book. That establishes uh, that they developed it on your time and that it's yours. And you can kind of keep control of that. You have it in a book and then keep that thing secret. <laughs> that should be part of your policy, by the way. All right, how are we doing on time? About five minutes. I'm gonna finish uh, pretty well here. Infringing on trademarks. This is the other big intellectual property asset that um, companies have is trademarks and logos. You built your company up, you've had it for years and, uh, and you've got um, um, so many um, customers and users and, and, and you've got name recognition. That is all inextricably tied in to your trademark. Okay, what's a trademark? That's a distinctive mark or logo. It distinguishes and identifies and separates your product or service from everybody else's that, that is out there. It might be your most valuable asset because it's just imagine if you couldn't use your name and logo, right? What would that do to your company? Um, think about Snapchat. If they couldn't use their name and logo, would there even be a Snapchat anymore? So um, <clears throat> social media, uh, B2C companies, it's usually really important. So think about this early uh, in branding a company and uh, a practice pointer. The first thing you should do, you know, uh, well, maybe not the first, but definitely high on your list uh, when you start a company is go do a Google search. Is there anybody else in the world that is using a similar name to provide a similar service? If there is, don't use that name as much as you like it. You're gonna end up fighting with them down the road. I could tell you stories, okay? Uh, how this has turned out well and how it has turned out spectacularly badly. Um, people losing their entire value because uh, people will sandbag. People who hold these marks, you know, they're not, they can't tell you that, but they might wait until the right moment and then hold you hostage with a cease and desist letter. So number one, do the Google search. Number two, do a patent and trademark office search. They call it a knockout search. And number three, you really ought to get trademark protection um, that's way beyond the scope of what we're going to talk about here tonight. We do whole programs on intellectual property. I just want to call this one out because there are too many people that don't think about this. You know, they just don't do the homework. Practice pointer, do that one up front. All righty then, 409A. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. This is the tax rule that says that options have to be granted at fair market value. Do you know what an option is? That is a right to buy stock in a company. The Silicon Valley was built on options. Uh, it's a great deal. You have people that come along, they wanna participate in the upside. They don't want the downside. They don't wanna pay money for their stock. You give them an option. An option says, we're gonna give you the appreciation and value in stock. Uh, you know, for Each option is an option on each share, appreciation and value of those shares without you even having to buy it. And if it goes down in value, you don't have to come out of pocket with any cash because it's just a right to buy the stock at a low value. So if it goes up in value, you'll cash out and take the difference. Um, the trick is, is that the strike price, the exercise price, the price at which they can actually exercise the option and buy the stock, it has to be fair market value as, as, as of the date of grant. And that implies a professional valuation. Um, the regulations do not technically absolutely require it. It's a, it's a safe harbor, but they're gonna require due diligence, okay? Um, 
and uh, especially if you get into an acquisition scenario. Deferred salary is another place people mess this up. They say, GA, I haven't been getting paid forever. I'm just going to throw on the books uh, that the company owes me $100,000 and I'll just take it someday later when we get funded. Um, there's ways to make that work, but it is much more formal than what I've just described. Just keep that in mind before you... Get... By the way, if you do mess this up, it's humongous. It's 20% it's uh, penalties plus tax. Uh, so you got to pay tax on it and you got to pay 20% then you got to pay interest. So you could end up paying... Plus you got to pay state. So you could end up paying 80% more, 80% uh, of the value of what you're getting. I've seen that happen. Jeez, I got a lot of these. I thought they're only top 10. Okay, failing to comply with securities laws. Um, I got to tell you, I am spending so much time going through safes. I'm going to change this slide because the securities laws, yeah, please comply with securities laws. I can introduce you to people that are sitting in jail that did not comply with securities laws and, and they didn't do anything that you would think was all that bad. Uh, so yeah, you need to pay attention to that stuff. And it's so easy to go online and download a document um, and not file anything with the federal government or the states um, and uh, just take the money, even though you're taking it from somebody you should be taking it from. This is complex, complicated stuff. Uh, we don't have time or I would get into it in detail, maybe in the Q&A. Uh, what I'm saying is use a lawyer before you sell a security. This is just way too risky. You're playing with fire, but that might not be your biggest problem. Uh, I've been spending a lot of time lately reading safes that people have downloaded off the internet um, and uh, with that and signed them without really knowing what they signed. And, uh, are, and I have to give them the bad news as to how much of their company they actually gave away. You gotta be really careful with securities, be super careful with these instruments. So I'm gonna replace the big mistake of failing to comply with securities laws with the bigger, because I can fix that usually. Maybe we rescind and we give the money back, but I can fix that. I can't fix if you gave your company away inadvertently. I just can't fix that. So uh, be really careful when you sell a security that you know what you're doing. Don't assume that because it's a safe, you're just selling what everybody else does and it's all gonna be okay. I've seen many companies, I'm not making this up. I've seen companies not get funded because they had too many safes out, too many safes. The investor came along and remember what I said about having enough founder equity? They said, there's not enough equity left in the deal. You sold too much, too cheap. You know, we'll next, you know, we'll go down to the founder who didn't do that. All right, we're getting towards the end here. So um, I'm gonna go over by a couple minutes because I, I just have to mention this. Um, if things start to go bad, um, and almost every startup is insolvent by definition when it starts out. So it's under a microscope. And you, the last thing, you wanna be able to live to fight another day, okay? Uh, I, have, I have some very successful founders um, in my stable who the first one or two times out did not do well, right? How many times did Abraham Lincoln lose an election before he was president? I think six times. He lost the Senate. He lost, he just lost, lost, lost. Biggest loser in politics. And he became the greatest president, right? Or a great president. So there's nothing wrong with that. There's no shame in Silicon Valley if your idea doesn't make it. The shame would be is if you assume personal liability and you didn't make it because of that. Don't do that. We really need to protect you from that. And how's that going to get you? Wages. We have a relatively recent statute in California that's going to stick founders personally for unpaid wages. Payroll taxes. We have an old law in the United States that will stick founders uh, and, and almost everybody else in the company too. Um, officers, even bookkeepers. I've seen bookkeepers get tagged uh, for unpaid payroll taxes. Um, don't ever do anything fraudulent. It's just not worth it. Just not worth it. Don't ever lie. You know, uh, you know, there's a fine line between puffing and lying and everybody knows your projections are made up, but um, make sure that you do not misrepresent a fact as opposed to your opinion about what the future will hold. And several other things, but we do a whole hour on this. You should look up the video, look at the slides, but um, protect your downsides. So if things don't work out, you can live to fight another day. And then finally, here where I practice in Silicon Valley, there's tons of excellent lawyers who do this all day long. It's easy to find startup lawyers. Make sure you get a startup lawyer when you do this stuff um, because uh, not all lawyers are startup, not all lawyers are created equal, okay? <laughs> there are a lot of things that I would not try to do 
um, there's a lot of things that only startup lawyers should try to do. And there's a lot more lore than law sometimes in this. There's a lot more about being where the market is than you know having you know the best you know legally sound structure in the world. If you do that, you'll end up paying a hundred thousand dollars to incorporate your company. I have seen that happen, believe it or not. Uh, but it was an absolutely bulletproof corporation that nobody would invest in. Um, on the other hand, if you go the other way, you might end up with something that nobody wants to touch either for other reasons. So just make sure that that you're working with people that know what they're doing. You're doing the right thing, by the way. Coming to presentations like this, understanding what the issues are and what questions to ask and what to watch out for, because your lawyers not always can be counted on to tell you that, right? If you can ask, you're way ahead of the game. If you can ask about vesting, if you can ask about employee classification, if you can raise the issues, because they might not, they might not have that sort of visibility into what you're doing. So congratulations to you for being here and catching a few of these issues. My name is Roger Royce. I'm a partner with Haynes and Boone in Palo Alto, California, heart of the Silicon Valley. I represent startup companies. Thank you for being here. I'm gonna open it up to questions. Uh, what I would suggest to all of you, but first I'm going to share my information one more time before people drop off. Um, what I'd like people to do is put their questions in the Q&A box, not in the chat box, uh, put it in the Q&A box, and uh, I will take it from there. By the way, before you drop off, I mentioned my book. That's my book. I'll send an e-copy to everybody who attended here today and stayed through this entire presentation and passes a short quiz after, of course, to make sure you're paying attention. All right, we'll pass on the quiz. I'll just give my book to everybody who is here. How's that? Uh, so stay tuned for that. Uh, stay tuned for my email. And now let us stop the share and uh, go to the questions. So, whoops, I'm going to give me a second here. Yes, this is recorded. Yes, uh, I'm going to circulate a link to my YouTube channel where you can watch the recording. And um, yes, I'm going to send my slides. Okay, how many questions do we have here? Holy Toledo. We're going to be here a while. Okay, first question. Boy, that Rob Lau is certainly an inquisitive guy. Look at all the questions. How much of US law would be applicable similar to Canada? Well, I'm not a Canadian lawyer. Um, but uh, much like Sarah Palin, I grew up close to a border. I could see Canada from where I grew up. I'm from North Dakota. In fact, I used to go up to Winnipeg and Saskatoon all the time. But nevertheless, that does not make me a Canadian lawyer. But I have done a lot of Canadian deals. And it is true. I'll say two things about Canada. I'll say three things because Steve Jobs, he's got to have three points. Number one, um, Yes, the law is quite similar because it's you know similar similar to ours based on the British system. So it is quite similar in a lot of respects. Um, number two, surprisingly, Canada is complicated when we're dealing with the US. I do a lot of inbound from other countries coming into the US. You think Canada would be super easy and it's actually not. Uh, it creates some tax issues that we don't have with other countries. Um, uh, especially the ones that are more lightly regulated, you know, Hong Kong, Singapore, et cetera. So, it, you know, it's, and I do, a, by the way, we do a whole hour on international companies coming into uh, the United States. I talk a lot about this. And the third thing is you need a Canadian lawyer. Okay, don't ask me for Canadian advice. I can't provide it, uh, but I can refer you to lots of good Canadian lawyers uh, because did I mention I used to be able to see Canada. If you want to be an international company, but want to be headquartered in America, what things should we know? I want to headquarter in the USA, but my target business country is China. So I see that all the time. That's like half my business. And what you, well, there's a halo over me. I just now noticed that. Hope that's not bothering people. Um, we'll edit that out in a video. What you need to know is you should be a Delaware C corporation uh, if you were going to solicit um, funding from US investors, because they will prefer a Delaware corporation. Doesn't mean they won't invest in something else. Some of them will, if you're hot enough, they will, um, or if it's a particular kind of investor. But you have a heck of an advantage, especially a venture capitalist, uh, if you are a Delaware C corporation. But you're saying, no, my, my company is in China. How can I be Delaware? What do I do? Well, what you do is what we call a flip transaction. 
I don't know why we call it that. I guess it's because we flipped the structure around. We put the foreign company underneath the US company that we just formed and the shareholders of the foreign company now own shares of the US company. Okay, that is the strategy, that's the system. That's, that's what you would do if you wanna be a US-based international company with business overseas. And like I say, that's very common. We do that all the time. Um, it is a thing of beauty when it is done well. It is a tax disaster if you don't get that right. Usually not on the US side. The US side's easy. It's the foreign side where we run into problems. Where should we incorporate? A co-founder, I don't even have to read the rest of the sentence, Delaware. All right, I'll read the rest of the sentence. My co-founder and prospects are in California. I live in Massachusetts and I'm the majority shareholder. Yeah, it's still Delaware. Um, and again, um, not to be flippant about this, but I gotta ask you something. Are you gonna take investors? They're gonna prefer Delaware. If there's gonna be VCs, they're going to insist on it. They're going to demand it. Uh, even if you're not, you've got shareholders sitting in different parts. You might not wanna stay in California. So if you're a Delaware corporation, you just withdraw from doing business here and you up and move and your corporation moves and California is done with you. Uh, if you're a California corporation, you won't have the luxury. You're gonna be stuck in a California system whether you live here or not. So incorporate in Delaware, that's usually the right answer. I mean, I'm a Calif I'm licensed in six states, by the way. Delaware is not one of them, but 95% of the companies, maybe more that I form are Delaware law. Um, if you guess which six states, I'll send you a copy of my book. All right, I'm gonna send it anyway, so no one's gonna guess. What kind of form of remote employee or freelancer, what form should a remote employee sign in order to keep IP in the company? Well, thank you, Rob Lau. The, the agreement you should sign is the one that I showed you, the invention assignment. It's oftentimes called a proprietary information agreement and invention assignment, or alternatively, a confidential information agreement and invention assignment. It's the invention assignment part of that that's really significant. That's what you wanna do. Now with an employee, I know some of you are gonna get all technical on me and say, well, we got a shop right and the employer owns that automatically. Yeah, uh, maybe, you know, that might be true, but we don't wanna have that battle. We don't wanna have that fight. Um, I don't want to, remember the California labor code provisions that kind of give the, you know, just pretty employee favorable. I want them to just sign a document that says they assign it. Okay, this is a non Rob Law question. I did some software development, they didn't pay me. I have not signed an IP assignment. What if I just take the product to market who owns it is your question, basically. Boy, a lot of questions about invention assignments. So here's what happens. Uh, let's break this down. If you're an employee, um, I think your employer has a shop right and they probably own it. Unless you show that you were doing this on your own time, you know, et cetera, your, your, own, your own facilities, all the stuff we talked about. Uh, so that's why I want you to specifically assign it uh, because there might be something in there that, that you did yourself that belonged to you or you brought with you, I don't know, from home or whatever. If you're a contractor, it's way worse. Uh, if you're a contractor, uh, you probably, you know, because the court's going to have to define intent. And what they will oftentimes define is that, well, you both have rights. Okay, company, you own it, but you contractor, you have a non-exclusive license. That means you can use it. What did I say about ownership about an hour ago? Ownership is the right to keep other people from, from using it. You can't claim ownership if someone has a non-exclusive license and can use it. So it's a big mess, okay? It's a big mess. You'll have to go into court and let a judge resolve it. Um, I can't give you a definitive answer because this is California and courts will try to do justice, but those are some general rules. And one thing I have one definitive answer I can tell you is nobody wants to deal with that. Investors are gonna hate it. Um, no one's going to want to deal with it. So just try to get the documents buttoned up. Now, in practice, when I've seen this happen, um, the market just assumes that the company doesn't own it. That's just the assumption. Uh, so that's the working assumption. I can come up with really nice technical legal arguments where maybe they do, et cetera. But in practice, as a practical matter, the market will treat you and value you as if you do not own the thing that wasn't assigned. Does an email stream or an SMS count as a contract? Why, well, yes, it does. Uh, you just have to prove, is it a writing? That's the real question. Um, so um, a little bit about contract law. 
something I haven't thought about in about 40 years. Um, the elements of you have to have an offer and acceptance. You have to have consideration. Um, so if your email stream shows that offer and acceptance and it's supported by consideration, um, you know, I, I think you've I think you've got a good contract. Now, um, some contracts require more formality than that. Okay. You have to go to the civil code to, to find out what they are. But you can have an, an oral contract. That means that it's not that it's not in writing. Okay, you can have that kind of contract. And this is good evidence of the contract itself. So yeah, it, you know, generally yes, but again, like I say, some have to be in writing and some and are, and of course I didn't even talk about there are defenses to contracts as well. Um, you know, the bigger question is it takes very little paper sometimes to, you know, to, to put you on the map and establish your rights. So, you know, that's not great that all you got is emails. Um, and more people get in trouble with that, uh, especially and even in writing in, in letters of intent and term sheets and things like that. And especially in emails where, where people get in trouble where here's my emails, here's my contract and they lose. It's because the court will say, well, look, obviously you did not intend to be bound. Right. And one of the reasons we know that is you didn't bother going to the trouble of putting it into a separate written document. That's the trouble with relying on emails. So if you're going to do that, you better make it super clear that everybody intends to be bound. Um, trying to think, I was about to give you a good example, but why don't we move on? I think I think you get I think you get the idea. Oh, here's the example. Even in letters of intent now, um, I'm very clear in everything I write. I put in language that says whether we intend to be bound or not. Say this is a binding agreement, or this is just a non-binding invitation to negotiate, or this thing's gonna expire in a week no matter what, things like that. So the more clear you can be, the better. Otherwise you gotta let a judge figure it out. Um, I think I already answered the question about what about remote people, what they have to do to keep the IP in the company. Um, so here we got some poor, struggling, starving students with no money, but lots of equity. Um, heard that one before. Uh, about to close a deal. Can we get away with an LLC and then use the money to pay for a C Corp? I assume you mean, well, I don't know. I shouldn't assume. I don't know what the deal is. I don't know if that's a customer or an investor, but the answer is yes, either way. Uh, and a lot of companies do that. Uh, it, it's expensive because you're paying for two entities now instead of one. Uh, in other words, you got to pay to form the LLC and then you got to pay to form a corporation. Um, so it's not ideal. When I go LLC to corporation, it's not because we don't have enough money. Uh, it's because we don't know if we're ever going to be a corporation. We might just be a yogurt shop forever, which should be an LLC or an S Corp or something. So the answer is yes, you can, but that's usually not the best answer. Not for that reason, to put it that way. Is there a benefit of starting as an S Corp and changing to a C? Okay, there's a lot of parts to this question. Let me take that one. The reason people form S Corps or form LLCs that are taxed as S Corps or do any of that stuff is, is by the way, I am not trying to be political at all. I'm absolutely not. If I am, I apologize. I didn't mean that. I'm trying to report the facts. Joe Biden has an S-Corp. Joe Biden ran I don't know, something like $17 million through his S-Corp for book royalties. Why did he do that? Well, I don't know why, but one thing that did happen is he avoided paying self-employment taxes. Nothing wrong with that. That's bread and butter tax planning. Everybody does it. That's why you have S-Corps. You don't have to pay self-employment taxes on the dividend portion of the income. I wrote a blog about this about five years ago and nobody cared. <laughs> so, um, so that's why you would use an S Corp. That's the beauty of it. Why doesn't everybody do that? Why doesn't every startup do that? Because remember that qualified small business stock thing I told you about? Only C Corps can issue qualified small business stock. S Corps can't. So you really shoot yourself in the foot on that one. Don't start as an S Corp unless you know you're always going to be an S Corp. By the way, I do have a way of fixing that mistake if any of you have made it. Again, it's, you know, it's, it's complex and a lot of paper, but it works beautifully. Um, can you raise dollar signs on a safe and switch to a C prior to the moment when the sale happens? And create multiple stock tranches after the sale of the safe. Um, I'm not quite sure I follow you, so let me break it down. Yes, you can always raise money. Even LLCs can raise money on safes. They do it all the time. There's some tax issues, by the way, um, but nobody but me seems to care about them. 
Uh, but yes, you can raise money on saves. Um, can you switch to a C Corp? You can always switch to C Corp. It's as easy as falling off a log. In fact, you might inadvertently do that without knowing it. Um, a moment when the sale happens. I assume you mean the sale of stock, uh, of preferred stock that would force you to be a C Corp. Yes, that's a strategy. We do that a lot. Again, you've given up that qualified small business stock, but you could do that. And then create multiple stock tranches after the sale. Yep, you can do all of that. I just don't think you should. All righty. Squirrel asked a question. What about um, foreign? I'm, I'm assuming that's not your real name, by the way, because I don't want to give away confidences. Um, okay, well, I'll, I'll, try to, uh, I'll try to dress up the question. What about a foreign startup? Uh, being approached to take foreign funding. Um, a foreign startup seeking foreign funding. So far, there's nothing US going on in this. You don't even need to call me. Um, but I think what you're saying is that you do have a US aspect to this. So let me rephrase the question. I think what you're saying is that, well, we're a foreign company. We're going to take money from foreign investors, but we're going to do business in the United States. And you know what? We might take money from US investors down the road. You kind of have to pick your poison. You're in Australia. I've done that deal with Australia. Again, Australia is one of those that you would think should be super simple to migrate into the US. It's not, especially if you've taken government money or, or taken advantage of some of the government incentives in Australia for startups. So we need to think through that carefully with two sets of counsel, US and Australian and tax counsel, because it's a tax issue primarily. But what I tell people when they ask me this question is you gotta pick your poison. You gotta decide who you're gonna be. You gotta be Ron Doss and get all existential and decide, are you a US company or are you an Australian company or whatever country you're from? And make that decision earlier. It's a lot less painful to do it earlier and then stick with it than to do it later where there's likely tax consequences moving one jurisdiction to another. The best entity for foreign owned companies in the US, um, for foreign owned companies. So you wanna know the best foreign owner? Well, I don't know, I use Cayman a lot, uh, although Cayman is way more complicated than you might think. Uh, they've got know your customer laws there that they didn't have several years ago. Uh, some people go to BVI uh, for, for that reason. Some people go to Singapore. I, I think it kind of depends. I think my rule is you should pick a holding company that, that has some sort of connection to your business, your investors. Um, I mean, Singapore is great if you're doing business in Southeast Asia or if your investors are in Southeast Asia. Hong Kong is awesome if you're doing something in China, either business or investors. It makes sense. So does BVI. Um, but um, I would go Luxembourg if, if everything you're doing is Europe. Um, I've even done Liechtenstein. You ever been to Liechtenstein? There's fewer people in Liechtenstein than North Dakota, which is where I'm from, and it's next to Canada. All right. Um, if a company has multiple founders, what protections can be put in place to prevent one or more founders from slacking their fair share of work? So uh, I had a client years ago, and uh, he drew up his own agreement. And uh, I knew there was something wrong by the names. You know how he didn't want to use party A, party B. He said um, he called, he and his co-founder, he called one of them himself worker, and he called the other one slacker in the agreement. So I had a hint. That was a hint. I'm a lawyer. I'm trained to detect these things that somebody probably wasn't, was perceived as not working as hard as the other one. Um, what you do to protect yourself is you have vesting restrictions. The vesting restriction means that if somebody, first of all, you should have a governance structure in place where somebody actually can be removed from service if they're not doing their job. And if they are, um, that the um, shares that are unvested get returned to the company in that event. That's what you should do. That's how you deal with that scenario. Um, and you're right, a lot of founders, and I'll, I'll tell you what, if you've got three founders, maybe you'll stick together for a while. If you've got more than three, not a chance, not a chance, it's just too many. Um, somebody's gonna go someplace, you know, someone's gonna leave. And you just got to have protections and provisions in place to deal with that. You got to have that equity back. You need that equity back because you're going to be giving it to somebody else to replace that person. Oh, man, I need to speed this up. Uh, by the way, if I don't get to your questions, feel free to email me or call me or, or link with me on LinkedIn or tweet me on Twitter or whatever 
take a picture of me on Instagram, whatever. Or talk to me on social media. I'm happy to answer these. Um, if I get stock grants with no vesting schedule, do I need to file an 83B today? No, 83B uh, um, stock grants um, with no vesting schedule. Let's talk about 83B. If you have no vesting, you have no 83B problem. 83B, what it does as a technical matter is it treats unvested shares as owned by you. Without 83B, you're not treated as owning shares that are subject to a substantial risk of forfeiture, i.e. a vesting restriction, until they actually vest. Up to then, the IRS views it as those, those aren't even your shares. You could lose them anytime. You know, you could get kicked out of the company. So uh, because they're not your shares, you're gonna get taxed on them when you do get them. Because even though you paid a dollar for it now, when you actually get them, when the vesting restrictions lapse, they're gonna be worth $10, you get $9 of income. So we file 83B to prevent that from happening. We say, hey, IRS, let's just pretend that I own them all now. I paid a dollar, they're worth a dollar, regardless of what happens in the future. And IRS says, okay, we'll pretend as long as you get that 83B election within 30 days. So it's only a, a unvested stock grant. It does not apply to options, okay? An option is not a transfer of property. An option is a bare contractual right. I've litigated that issue, right? So um, you don't need to file an 83B when you get an option. When you exercise the option, however, you are now purchasing stock. You are now having a transfer of property in the IRS's view. And then you, if it's unvested stock, then you do file the 83B. So I hope that is way more, you're sorry you're asked, you asked now, right? And that's way more information than you wanted. Um, somebody asked if trademarks, they got, they've got they got a name, but they notice there's a foreign company has the same name. Um, is that an issue? Oh yes, that is an issue because trademarks of course are, um, they are territorial. So two things, number one, uh, they probably have rights prior to yours in whatever territory they're in using it. Uh, if they registered and, or if they've used it before you, that's the US system anyway. And secondly, I wouldn't bet that they're not. In today's world, you can't assume people are staying uh, within the four corners of their country. Uh, you have to assume they're, they're doing business worldwide. Um, I would take a hard look at that and think about if you're going to have to change your name, do it early. Find out what your rights are. And then, and by the way, you could go either way. In this. I had a client um, five years ago, maybe longer. They had a name that somebody was using almost the exact same name in a foreign country. And uh, we had built so much value in it. We said, my client said, I'm not giving this name up. It's too valuable. I'll fight. So we sued them, right? Then they litigated. They spent a lot of money and he ended up, you know, ending up with the name. So, you know, I'm not saying you have to lie down and die. I'm saying you ought to at least know what's out there and what the environment is. Um, where was I? Uh, what if I want to enable a small number of friends and family to invest via safes? And I know that non-accredited is not ideal, but can I? Um, so the answer is yes, you can. You probably don't want to. I really try to discourage people. You can take up to 35 unaccredited investors um, before you have to give fairly, well, you, let's just put that as a hard limit, uh, not get into the rest of this. Um, the problem with doing that on a safe is that safe is going to convert into another security at some point, and then you're you're going to have all sorts of problems. Your investors, because of the securities laws, are not going to be allowed to convert, and you're going to have to cash them out. Uh, I've seen that happen, so that's why it's not ideal. Now, the way some of the big organizations get around that that promote these is you have the safe convert into some different security, so you don't have to aggregate. We're getting way deep in the weeds. Uh, the answer is it's complicated. If you do that, uh, you're gonna regret it. You're gonna end up spending a lot of money uh, in legal fees, uh, getting those unaccredited investors into your company. Not today, but probably down the road when you have additional financings and additional compliance issues. Uh, oh, benefit corporation. We wanna incorporate as a benefit corporation. Does everybody know what that is? So a... Um, any challenges and key benefits? Well, the key benefit, by the way, Benefit Corporation has been doing pretty well, uh, surprisingly. A benefit corporation, in the term that you're using it, by the way, sometimes there's different kinds of statutes, there's flexible purpose corporations, et cetera. But the general idea is that directors of corporations generally are required to maximize shareholder wealth. They need to think about money and that's it. 
maximize shareholder wealth, not saving the environment, not being good to their employees, not uh, whatever, no, you know, just maximize wealth. In a, in, in a special kind of corporation that we're talking about here, uh, you can have a charter that says, you know what, board of directors, not only should you make money for us, you should do well while doing good. Um, in other words, you should do good while doing well, I should say. So we want you to you know, share the wealth with your employees. We want you to protect the environment. We want you to advance the causes of science and cure cancer or whatever it is. And the shareholders can't sue you for uh, focusing on making that part of the corporate mission, even though it does not necessarily maximize well. Surprisingly, those companies are doing pretty well. There's a whole body of law. There's a whole, there's a whole culture around that. I know a lot of people that do that. So if you're the right kind of company, uh, that is the benefit. The challenge, of course, is that you're not maximizing shareholder wealth and there's a certain type of investor that is not going to touch you. But there's a lot of impact investors who, um, you heard of impact investing, they want to make an impact and you can do that through a benefit corp. Okay, here's somebody, it's co-founding a new company. They've got an old Delaware C corporation sitting on the shelf. Um, can we just rename the company and start? Yes, you can, but I'd be awfully careful about that because if it's an old company, it, it may have old baggage and you don't want to carry that old baggage along uh, into your new business. I have done exactly that pretty successfully. I had a company that they, they did their first business and they started in 1986. They sold it, made tons of money. And against my advice, used that company to start their new business. And uh, once you know, we, you know, we, and by the way, they sold the assets so they kept the shell. And it was fine. I mean, even though we had like, how many years is that? 40 years of due diligence. That was the problem. So you can, but I wouldn't just start new because we got lucky. What if there's a claim hanging out there from way back when litigation, employment tax? Um, it's, it's not that expensive. A couple thousand dollars and you don't have to, you can sleep at night. You don't have to look over your shoulder. Here's a, an LLC registered as an S Corp. Being, uh, okay, so here's somebody doing the Joe Biden strategy. How difficult to convert to a C Corp? Well, there's two things. Uh, as a tax matter, it's super easy. You can terminate that S Corp election whenever you want. You can't reelect again within five years if you do that, but it's super easy to terminate that. Uh, it's a Delaware LLC. So then we would secondly file a conversion document in the state of Delaware. And how easy or difficult it is depends on how many shareholders there are uh, and what your agreements say about that. Don't, don't forget about that. You probably have some agreements, a lease, a line of credit, copy or lease, whatever it is that may have um, some provisions in there that govern what you do with your company. So we have to look at all that stuff. So it could be very simple if, if there's no, no problems. You know, I have got, uh, yes, I can recommend a lawyer in Luxembourg, just email me. And unfortunately, we did not get through all our questions. I apologize for that. Um, but uh, let me just take a look here if there's anything else I want to hit. If someone else is using the same name, could you come to a peaceful settlement where you use both the names separately? Yes, that happens all the time. Um, just a coexistence agreement. We see that a lot. Um, should I exercise my stock options early? Maybe. Um, you might pay tax if you do, if they're NSOs and there's some spread, a non-statutory option, and the stock is worth more than the strike price, uh, you're going to pay some tax on that exercise, but then you lock in the compensation element, all the future appreciation is capital gain, taxed at a low rate. So you might want to do that. If it's an ISO, you'll pay AMT if you're in a high enough bracket. Yeah, way more than you want it to know. The answer is maybe. And by the way, we do that analysis all the time, especially for people just about to leave California. And want to know how they can beat the state out of some income tax. All right, let me see what else. Uh, I'm just going to do one or two more. So we've got a, a for-profit social impact company. Um, do I still advise a Delaware C Corp? Um, here's my rule. I should have been spent more time on this. So thanks for asking. We'll close with this because the last two questions are about this. Um, if if you're the kind of company that you're going to need institutional money to, to, to launch and scale and, and become great and exit, then if you're going to need a VC, then you just, just start as a Delaware Corp, right? Because that's where you're going to end up. And it's a lot easier to do it sooner than later. If you're the kind of company that 
you're not going to take venture money. You're not going to become humongous. You're going to become moderately profitable and you're going to pay your people and you might get rich off this company, but you're not going to take outside financing, uh, at least not from a VC, maybe from some angels. Um, and you're not going to scale like, you know, Silicon Valley tech startups. Then your lifestyle company, be, be an, an S corp and avoid payroll taxes or be an LLC and get the QBI um, deduction or as long as while we have it anyway. If you don't know, and that's so many of them, you just don't know, you could go either way. That's when I'll spend, say, spend the extra money, do the LLC and flip it into a C corp down the road once we figure it out. Now there are complexities with that. We do it all the time, but just be aware. There are complexities. There could be tax consequences when you do that. There's, um, 144, uh, rule 144 holding, nobody knows what that means, but there's securities consequences, but it can be done and it is done all the time. So that's the, the wait and see. If you wanna pay to see that next card, you ever play poker? You know, you wanna put another bet down and play to see the, pay to see the next card, that's how you do it. So it's really a very individualistic um, decision unless you're on one side of the spectrum. All righty, and I think we're going to go ahead and close on that question because I like that question. Thanks. I <laughs> talk, could talk for an hour about choice of entity. Um, so again, uh, I'm Roger Royce. I'm a partner with Haynes and Boone, Palo Alto, down to, downtown Palo Alto, heart of Silicon Valley. I'd like to thank ID to IPO for, for setting us up. I want to apologize for all of those of you who, um, who don't see your name uh, and see somebody else's name. Uh, and if I did inadvertently lock anybody out that tried to log in as a panelist, I hope you were able to come back in as an attendee. Uh, sorry about that. I didn't mean to do that. Um, again, uh, be sure to be back. I do this every other week for IDEA to IPO. Uh, we do topics regularly. Um, you can see them on my YouTube channel. It's uh, Roger Royce Law YouTube. Find me, subscribe, get on our LinkedIn site. Um, get on our mailing list. Come on, join the community. We got tons of good content. All right. Thank you. And we will see you next time.